This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 9 deals with groups, groups of individuals at work. Uh, we've mentioned groups briefly uh, already uh, in the work of Elton Mayo, who you might remember uh, was the initiator of the Human Relations School of Management. Uh, and he, as one of his results of his experiments, uh, identified the existence of what was called informal groups of people, uh, invisible or not to be recognized or not dreamt of by management, uh, but groups of people, maybe just the people working together, could, could form a group uh, which could perhaps then a very powerful group norms uh, and which could resist the actions of management. Anyway, they're, they're very important in organizations and groups uh, can be defined as follows. Again, handy is a nice, um, simple definition. Any collection of people who perceive themselves to be a group. Uh, and this is quite nice because this idea of perceiving yourself to be a group allows for both formal uh, and informal groups. If you perceive yourself to be a member of a group with other people, then there is a group. And Andy said that the uh, characteristics of uh, a group is that they will have a, a sense of purpose or an aim. So it, it could be that an informal group, their sense of purpose or their aim uh, is not to increase productivity uh, or to resist you know, coming into work on a Saturday or something like that. Or it might be a more positive sort of a, a aim, that maybe their aim is to uh, improve quality. They have an identity, you know who's part of the group and who's outside the group, who's us and who's them, and, and so on. There are group norms, accepted ways of behaving. Uh, and then there is communication within the group, uh, because you have to, apart from anything else, uh, communicate your aims, and communicate your norms. So to get an idea of how a group could very quickly establish itself where there really hadn't been one before, uh, let's say you were coming to um, to work or something, or you're on the bus, uh, and, you know, by and large in the morning and you're on the bus, you're not talking to your neighbours whom you don't know, these strangers and so on, you're there buried in your, your uh, phone or your newspaper, whatever it is, uh, and then suddenly the bus has an accident. And suddenly now you have become a bit of a group because you might have a, a, a name that if people were injured on the bus, uh, then the aim might be to get some sort of compensation because of the accident. Uh, there is an identity, you know, you know now these people are on the bus, they're part of this accident, these part people have nothing to do, uh, these, no, these just other commuters, nothing to do with this group. There are group norms, there may be pressure on you, uh, to say the accident happened in a particular way. It may, may, it may you know, actually be unfair uh, pressure. Uh, there may be pressure on you to say that uh, it was somebody else's fault. Uh, there may be pressure on you to uh, say they've been injured and you want to claim for compensation uh, so that if you're claiming for compensation, you know, it increases everybody's chance perhaps of getting compensation. And of course, there's communication. Uh, whereas you've previously been uh, reading your paper, reading your uh, emails or something on your phone, suddenly there's an accident, you begin talking to each other uh, about you know, what had occurred and, and what should be done and so on. Now, uh, one of the important writers on the group is called uh, Belbin, uh, and Belbin said that as uh, one of the characteristics of a, a, a team, and a team is a, uh, is a group which has been formally created by management. You could have your, uh, your IT implement implementation team. Uh, there could be the new project launch team. Uh, there could be the, uh, uh, the team who's going to be responsible for opening the uh, organization in France or something of that sort. And, and what you get, first of all, with, with the team, you know, if it's formed properly, you, you get technical skills coming in. So you're opening up in France, then you'll want you know, a salesperson, you want maybe a manufacturing person, uh, you, you want a, a purchasing person, you want someone who's capable of finding the 
the right premises in France and so on. So one of the things, like a, like a football team, you bring together people of different skills. There's a striker, the defender, there's a goalkeeper and so on there. Uh, and their different skills are together far better than anyone separately. But Belvin said that the other thing that, that you bring together are people of different personalities. Uh, and you have to be, uh, again, as you want a nice spread over the tactical skills, it's quite nice if you get a nice spread over the, the personality traits as well. And he said there were the following. Uh, there's the chairman. Uh, you can read all about this in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the notes. I'm not going to go through each one in absolute detail. Uh, but the chairman is someone with a bit of natural authority. They're quite good at uh, maybe placating, uh, you know, where there's disagreement amongst the group. The chairman can maybe seek compromises. Uh, they're, they're quite good at making sure everyone has their say and, and is listened to and, uh, and so on. A shaper, different to a chairman, uh, a shaper is very much someone who has their own ideas and is, is quite, in a way, quite pushy to, to get those ideas realised. Uh, a shaper is, is likely to irritate people, rub them up the long, wrong way. Quite, I want this, etc., etc. They won't let it go. The chairman is, is more the, uh, the oils the wheels, so to speak, and tries to keep people together. I go down to just, I think, uh, two more uh, here. There is uh, the very last one, the completer finisher. Uh, some people get very excited at the beginning of projects and then lose interest. They may be very creative, but then you have created uh, these completer finishers who are very, very good at detailed work. So if you're creating a report, they'll be very, very good at proofreading it, making sure all the references are there and, and so on, uh, making sure all the documentation is complete very important to have that in large projects and we have the plant it always sounds quite quite bad uh, the uh, the plant however is someone that management has put into the, the team quite deliberately uh, we would say to ginger it up this this person is maybe quite the radical ideas and comes out with these radical ideas and kind of challenges maybe a, a group which is a little bit complacent a little bit dull they are planted in there to to bring a bit of a, a radical thought to it and then the the last one here the specialist some groups you need a specialist maybe a specialist it person to give you technical advice and so on uh, about what you're doing uh, another writer is tuckman who looked at the stages of team development and he said the first thing is that the group forms. So if it's a, an informal group, uh, then the forming stage is going to take a little while. You're kind of, kind of sitting with your colleagues and, and gradually over time, the, the existence of the group uh, kind of evolves. Uh, and maybe you see a purpose of the group. Maybe you, you see, well, we better kind of stick together. Otherwise, we're going to have worse working conditions or something of that type. In a formal group where management deliberately creates a group, then the forming stage is very quick. The management says this is what it's going to be. These are the people in the team and that's what your purpose is. Secondly, Tuckman talked about storming. Uh, storming is kind of fighting jockeying for position really who's going to be the shaper who's going to be the chairperson and so on here uh, who's the kind of talkative one and so on who's very good at uh, maybe going out and trying to get uh, uh, resources for the group and budgets for the group and, and so on so it's a storming a little bit of power play in there to to get the position you want again if it's a formal group formed by management management can cut through this a lot say, right, you're the chairperson, you're the person in charge of it here, you're the person who's you know, recording the minutes and so on there. They can tell people what their roles are rather than letting people work out their roles and fight over them themselves. Norming is uh, settling down then to accepted ways of behaviour. How often are we going to meet? Uh, how long are we going to meet for each Friday morning and uh, uh, so on? Do we have to do it in our own time? Or are we doing it in work time, etc., etc.? 
etc. That's norming, uh, establishing acceptable group norms. And again, if it's a formal group, management will probably tell them. You are going to be meeting once a week. We expect you to be reporting in two months' time, either you know, after it's finished, in, in two months' time. And so on. we expect everybody to go to every meeting of the group and so on. You're establishing the kind of ground rules of how the group is to perform. And only then does it perform. So it's gone through these stages uh, here of forming, storming, and norming. Uh, without really any output. This is where you actually get the output. Something useful coming from it. All of the rest have been kind of preliminary. And as I say, uh, if management can be involved here, then it will simply accelerate people through to get very quickly to this performing stage. If management doesn't get involved there, there's going to be quite a bit of kind of time wasted up here. Uh, as, as people get down eventually to stage four. And then finally there is the dorming stage. Dorming as in dormitory, as in sleeping. Uh, really it means here that the group, uh, the team, the committee, whatever it is, it's, it's had its day. Uh, there's no real purpose on it anymore. Uh, it has performed, it has done what it should be doing. And now in a way the group is there because of habit. The group meets every Friday afternoon because for the last year we've been meeting every Friday afternoon and uh, habit will make us continue to, to do that. But really it's at this point that the group should be disbanded in some way uh, because it's, it's, as I say, it's kind of in a rut. There's nothing really for it to do. The lessons from Tuckman uh, really is that management can accelerate down to this very important stage here. He also said that if the people in the group, of one of them changes, then in a way you have a little mini forming, storming, norming as you go through. The new person joins, there'd be a little bit of finding his or her place, a little bit of storming in, in that there. This person will have to get used to the group norms or may even try to change the group norms and, and so on. But again, management can, can, can help that. They can send a memo around to people in the group saying this person is joining you this is their background so you get to know them this is what they're going to be particularly good at in the group this is why they're in the group in the team and so on uh, and okay there'll be a little bit of a disturbance but the group should be able to you know get to the performing stage fairly quickly and finally just a little bit on the difference between a team and a committee uh, a team is deliberately formed as a formal group it has very specific objectives, like put in or decide on a new IT system. They will have mixed skills. So if you're doing a new IT system, you'll want maybe somebody from the accounting department because they make a lot of use of IT. Maybe somebody from manufacturing, need an IT person quite obviously uh, and there. And then you may have a, a leader of it. So there may be four people on the IT steering committee uh, there. Uh, and there is definitely a leader somebody in charge of the other people and they come out with these very specific uh, objectives and very often very practical uh, objectives a team to decide on the new IT system a team to decide maybe on the new um, profit related pay system or scheme uh, and so on uh, a team maybe to decide whether or not we should uh, subcontract distribution to a firm of uh, uh, haulage contractors, a logistics firm, or whether we should keep it on board uh, in-house or, or not. A committee, on the other hand, again, it is formal. It is deliberately formed, certainly. Uh, but they tend to be much more decision-making rather than doing things. They basically bring together a lot of uh, input from different areas of the company. They can discuss what's need to be done, and they will very often produce a, a report, a formal decision, uh, and reporting methodology will, will come out but they tend not to be doing the activity themselves after the committee reports then maybe a team is formed to implement the committee's decision instead of having a leader they tend to have a chairman chairperson and so on which isn't so much telling people what to do uh, as making sure that everyone who comes to committee meeting is heard 
and you get a you know a good balance of opinions and that people are relatively happy with the uh, suggestions that are made on the final recommendations. This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com.